In today's video, we're going to compare five different oversold overbought confirmation signals, all with the simple goal of trying to answer which one is most effective. Now, an overbought oversold confirmation signal is most effective for fades along with reversal trade opportunities. Think buying the dip or fading the rip. So in today's video, the signals we discuss, the context we'll discuss them in, the scenarios, all of that is centered around that very specific trade scenario. Now, the five indicators we'll compare in today's video are the following. The first is the edge signals indicator, which is free for all volatility box members. This is the only indicator we'll talk about that's not freely available for you to test out yourself. The edge signals is comprised of the dynamic RSI along with the WADA ATAR indicator, and I think is our secret sauce in trying to capture reversal zones. You'll see this on our chart with the green and a red arrow. I'll show you that in just a second. The second indicator we're going to compare is the V-score. The V-score is free for everyone. You can download it on our website. Here's a link to do so, tosindicators.com slash indicator slash V-score. The overall premise here that we're going to be looking at is using uh, the extended zones on the V-score. So think three standard deviations in the positive or the negative side, or somewhere in between that two to three standard dev zone, to then try and identify that, hey, we're officially in overbought, oversold territory. Do we see a reversal coming in here? Then the next indicator we'll move on after the V-score is one that I think everyone should be familiar with. It's the RSI. We're going to measure, well, how effective was just a baseline RSI in comparison to these other two indicators, which have taken a little bit more sophisticated code to actually build them. After the RSI, we'll move on to the Fisher Transformer. We recently covered this in a tutorial where we built scans for the Fisher Transformer. In today's video, the goal is to identify, well, how effective is this oscillator in giving us signals that we can use to, again, catch either the dips or bathe the rips, whichever way we're uh, looking to go. Finally, the last indicator we'll talk about is one that's not always in the conversation for oversold, overbought zones, but I think is interesting nonetheless. It's the Market Pulse Indicator. This too is free for everyone. Here's the URL to download it, tosindicators.com slash indicator slash market pulse. Usually we use this to gauge direction. In today's video, we're going to try and see, well, can you actually use the period in which we change direction uh, as your means of confirming overbought, oversold zones? That means, let's say you had a bearish trend, so let's say a red line in the market pulse. Can you use that first period in which that line goes from red to gray to green uh, as your zone at, hey, we're officially now, let's say, oversold, and we're looking at starting the next move up higher? So that's the premise of today's video, five different signals. Hopefully it's informative uh, for both volatility box members as well as just folks looking to try and take advantage of the volatility in the markets and using that to profit from it in a more consistent approach that also aligns with your trading style. All right, so let's get started. The first indicator we'll take a look at is the edge signals indicator. And in all five of these, we're going to be using the volatility box on the S&P as that means of trying to figure out, well, this was our static scenario, which signal was more effective in helping us capture reversals from this zone. You'll see what I mean in just a second, but let's dive into charts. All right, so here I have a chart of the S&P 500. This is off of the conservative volatility box model, which is the one we were using today to start off the morning. And on the chart right now, I have just the edge signals loaded on as our overbought, oversold zone. Now you'll see here that price action towards the day bounced into our volatility box zones quite a bit, which is why I think this experiment is rather useful on a day like today. Out of all of these breaches that you're seeing, in terms of trades that met our trading plan that aligned with everything we were looking for, we had just two trade opportunities. The first was a long right here in which we had price action fall inside of our volatility box zone. We then had the edge signal confirmation, that's these green arrows right here, letting us know that, hey, we're officially now in oversold territory. We also had the volatility box on our side. The move that we were looking for here was 7.25 points, which you'll see here, 7.25 is the distance from the cyan line to the outer edge of the clouds. We made not only that move, but we exceeded that all the way up to 13.67 points. However, we fell short of our second target, which was up at 22 points. So in terms of this trade, using our trade plan, using the edge signals, we had a gain on the first contract of 7.25 points. And then the second contract was a stop out at break even at the sign entry line. Now, the second trade in the S&P came about right here in the short opportunity in which price had broken outside of our conservative box. That then took us from our conservative to our doomsday conservative models. That's the most conservative we can get really to try and participate in this volatility where we had price action breach our sign entry line. You had one, two, three, and 
four oversold uh, overbought confirmation signals in this case. And from that point, price you'll see reversed, giving you not only a T1, but also a T2. T1 in this case, in the second trade in the S&P, was a bare minimum move of eight points. We made the eight points, and then we had a flush down lower, a real nice flush, all the way down to 23.4 points. So we can round that down to, let's just say, 23 points, depending on where you got out. So in the S&P here, using the edge signal as our oversold, overbought confirmation signal, we were able to catch two different trade opportunities. The first was the long in that seven to eight zone, and the second was the short in that final hour of the markets, really. The trade triggered towards the end of that 11.30 to 11, uh, 12 o'clock PM Pacific zone, and then carried on into the final hour of the markets where we had a puke down lower. So that's the edge signal in terms of how effective it was. Two different trades. Both trades were winners whenever it did confirm those oversold, overbought moves. However, we did miss out on a few different scenarios. If I go back to the conservative model here, you'll see we had price action breach our zone right here where we did have the edge signal. However, this was towards the edge of the hour, so it didn't meet our trade plan rules. And the trade that we actually missed out on, which really met all other parts of our rules, was when price action breached our upper volatility box in that 10 to 11 a.m. Pacific hour. We were looking for this oversold, overbought confirmation, and that signal came. However, after that signal came, we had already hit our target before getting an opportunity to actually enter. So my goal is, well, do any of the other four signals give us this opportunity, let us be a little bit more aggressive, but actually participate in some of these zones? So again, just to summarize what the edge signal looked like, two trade opportunities, both were winners. First trade, good for 7.25 points and a stop out on that second contract. And then the second trade was a much nicer winner in which that second trade was good for both eight points on the first contract plus right around 23 points on the second contract. So this was really where I think we had a nice home run. Now let's move on next to overlaying this with the V-score. So if I load in the V-score, this is the lower V-score we're going to use. You can also use the upper if you'd like. I can change our anchor date to today's date. So we'll say 2021-09 uh, and then September 28th. We click OK, click Apply. Now using the V-score, let's paint out the zones again that we're looking at focusing in on. The first is right here in that 7 to 8 a.m. Pacific hour. The second is right here towards the edge of that 9 to 10 hour. The third is right here in that 10 to 11 a.m. Pacific hour, but the upper zone, so a short opportunity. And then finally, the last trade opportunity we had at our fingertips was towards the edge of that 11 and bleeding into the 12 to 1 Pacific hour. Now, using all of these zones, let's take a look to see what the V-score was telling us at that time. So if we come down in that first zone, you'll see the V-score is tagging the negative two standard deviation line as price action falls into our volatility box zones. It's effective in terms of being some sort of a significant area. However, we didn't really see the sort of arrows that we're accustomed to seeing. So I'd argue effective in terms of being in some sort of oversold territory, uh, but we didn't really see a high degree signal, something like an arrow that tells you, hey, this is the precise time you should be getting in. Now, next up, we had in that 9 to 10 a.m. Pacific hour, if I do the same thing, we draw the arrow right down here. This time, the V-score is kind of in no man's land, floating in between the negative 1 and negative 2 standard deviation lines. So again, this would be a signal that I would argue is not something that is a high confidence signal. Of course, it looks good looking back at your charts, but real time, I think you could have made a very compelling case that price action here could have continued going down lower, and the V-score could have tagged that negative 3 standard deviation line. Again, why I like seeing these green arrows is it's very much uh, a binary signal. Either it's printing or it's not. There's really no room for guesswork. Now, next up, we had when price action rallied into our volatility box zones. This time it was a short opportunity. We take a look at what's happening to the V-score right down here, and you'll see we're now bumping into that negative one standard deviation zone. You could argue that, hey, from that negative one standard deviation zone, price has fallen before, uh, but that really happened once and twice right here if you count this one as well. So you could argue that that was your signal there, but we again did not see the same sort of bearish signals that I think we're accustomed to seeing. Now finally, the last trade, this is where I think it gets a little bit interesting with the V-score, which the edge signal did also print, but that's right here where price action is slamming back into the zero standard deviation line after having been below zero for quite some time. Using the clouds right down here, very obvious to tell that the trend is negative. You'll see red, 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 red. And now we're getting that first retest of the zero standard deviation line. If there was a clear signal using the V-score, I would argue that it was this last trade that gave you sort of that best opportunity. Again, I prefer using the edge signals here, mostly because a red arrow is a lot easier to read compared to trying to determine if you're officially in oversold, overbought territory. 
So in terms of answering that initial question of which is best, out of the two that we've seen so far, I would argue that the edge signals, in fact, probably gave you cleaner trade opportunities, taking out much of the guesswork uh, that was required, and the V-score didn't necessarily give you more trade opportunities that we were looking for. So we can skip that. Now let's remove the V-score and add in the RSI, which is the third signal we're looking at comparing. So if I add in the RSI here, and let's paint back the same zones that we're looking at comparing. So we had this zone right here, we had this zone, we had the upper zone, and we had the upper zone right here. Now we'd like to see if the RSI right here is telling us that, hey, we're officially now in oversold territory or overbought territory. I'll turn on the show breakout signals, which is the arrow that the RSI has. And now that lets us, I think, have a more apples to apples comparison. So we draw this arrow right down here. The RSI is letting you know that you're officially in oversold territory. So I'd argue that this also a good sign right here. The RSI was a good signal, very clear, very easy to read. The second one that we had was in that 9 to 10 a.m. Pacific hour. We uh, scroll down and you'll see again, we're in no man's land. The RSI is not in any extreme zone, not below 30, not above 70. So no clear signal there. The second one, not as useful as the edge signal. Now the third signal right here definitely gets a little bit more interesting when price action hits the upper edge of the volatility box zone. And we also have the inversion point letting you know that, hey, you are actually seeing that overbought, oversold confirmation. And that came before the edge signal came. So in this case, the RSI was a little bit more aggressive and did actually give you a nicer opportunity to fade this zone along with the volatility box, giving you an actual entry at the sign entry line. So we can say plus one here for the RSI in comparison to the edge signal, which kept you out of this trade. So, so far the RSI here, a nice trade there. Now, finally, the last trade was towards the edge of the uh, hour of the 11 to 12 and then 12 to one, where if we scroll this down right here or expand this rather, again, price action in between that 70 to 30 zone, nothing too noteworthy there. And that second trade, at least with the edge signals, this final one was the one that was most effective. So in terms of which one I would have preferred trading, it would have been that latter one. The edge signal gave you that opportunity compared to the RSI, which got you into a more aggressive trade earlier on in the day. But then as the day progressed here, the RSI really didn't give you some sort of overbought, oversold edge there. So uh, in terms of how the two compare, I think you can see that the edge signals, along with actually using the dynamic RSI instead of the regular RSI, was a little bit more effective in capturing these overbought, oversold zones. Now, next up, the next indicator we'll compare is the Fisher Transformer. This is the FW Fisher Transformer, again, built inside of the platform. You can add that in. And let's repeat the same exercise here. Now, using the Fisher Transformer, the first thing that should stand out is the sheer number of arrows. There's a lot of them. So if you were to throw a dart almost anywhere on this chart, I'm sure you would have some arrow pointing there. So to try and keep things a little bit more systematic here, we can use places in which we have stacked arrows, letting us know that there's a little bit more weightage involved with this particular move. Now I'll zoom in here just so we can keep things a little cleaner. Our first breach of the volatility box was right here. We didn't really have any stacked arrows all the way up until 736, and that was after the move had already taken place. So I'd argue this signal came a little bit later than we would have liked. Keep moving forward here. Our next breach was that 9 to 10 a.m. Pacific hour. We take a look. We did have 946 in which the arrows were stacked, but that was before the volatility box was actually breached. And after we breached, we had the signal at 10.04 the next hour in which the signal was stacked and let you capture this move, albeit on a much more aggressive move. Now, next up, we had the short opportunity right here. There, you did have the 10.26 a.m. signal right here, which had stacked arrows. So I would argue that this was a little bit more effective than the edge signal for the short opportunity right here. Uh, but so far, that's been the one incremental winner with both the RSI and the Fisher Transformer, as we've seen. The real trick has really been seeing what happened in this final hour right here, where you can see no real stacked arrows. Price action just continued to keep going down. First time you had stacked arrows was 12.11, uh, after which price did start to get going, but that signal did come a little bit later than I think I would have liked in terms of having the same hour move. So there, again, you have a notion of how the Fisher Transformer compared uh, across the board here. I think this is just a little bit noisier of an indicator, and if you were to use it, then paying attention to these precise zones in which arrows are stacked might be a little bit more effective than simply trying to rely on any one of the million arrows that you're seeing on your chart. So that was the Fisher Transformer. Now, finally, the last one that we have is purely using the market pulse. That's this red line right here on your charts, which also turns green at certain points to try and capture those uh, reversal zones. 
This is off of a one minute time frame chart here. So you'll see as price is falling, that line is very clearly red. It then goes into this gray phase right here where we're now into a distribution phase. Price then breaks above that variable moving average line. We go green just for a little bit before then falling right back into the red zone. So here again, I would argue the edge signal was so far the most effective out of the five signals we've seen. The market pulse, not so effective today, not so effective on a meltdown day to try and capture reversal zones, but very much effective in knowing what the current trend is and what the preceding trend has been uh, just by looking at one line on your charts. You don't need to have moving averages or anything of that sort. So I find it effective from that standpoint, but not so much from an oversold overbought standpoint. Now keep moving forward here. The next signal that we had was a breach towards the 9 to 10 a.m. Pacific mark. Here, again, the market pulse is letting you know we're in a period of red. And finally, once we go into distribution here, you'll see trend actually picks up. So it was good in terms of knowing there's a trend switch coming, not necessarily so good in terms of giving you the most ideal entry. Uh, so that's the trade-off you had there. But it did give you this context right here, which let you know that the trend is now going from bearish to at least distribution to then this first green candle right here going into a bullish phase. Now keep coming up, we had the short opportunity here. Uh, by the time the short breach happened and the target was hit, the trend hadn't really changed yet. We were still very much in a bullish trend. So here, no signal in terms of the market pulse, but you did know that overall you're still bullish. We had a retest before then, the market pulse actually went bearish right here. So again, not an effective oversold, overbought signal, but still effective in terms of knowing what the trend is in a very just binary format, similar to the edge signals. Either we're in a stage of acceleration, accumulation like we currently are, distribution if it's just gray and prices below the variable moving average line or deceleration if the line is just straight up red now finally the last one that we have is right here this was towards the edge of the hour the 11 to 12 12 to 1 here you'll see the market pulse green price was rallying we had several plus 1000 tick readings and then price hit you'll see the market pulse starts to flatten off we go into that first period of distribution and then finally that very first red uh, on the market pulse line letting you know we're now entering deceleration so if anything, the market pulse was a little bit more useful for those of you that don't mind having slightly worse entry prices, but you'd like to wait for a confirmation. However, if you're looking for the best entry in terms of having an early entry, having an exact signal and having a very definitive price zone that you can enter in, so far out of the five signals we looked at in today's basis on the S&P, the edge signal was by and far the clear winner in terms of giving you high probability reversal zones, giving you signals that you didn't really have to guess around reading, uh, and giving you not too many signals where, hey, you still know where you'd like to pay attention to without being overwhelmed. All right, I hope this video was helpful for those of you looking to try and understand oversold overbought signals and which ones you'd like to use in your particular trading and which one fits best according to your trading style. Again, the final four that we discussed are all free, so feel free to play around with any one of these if you'd like. Uh, the V-score we found was effective in terms of knowing standard deviation zones, but not necessarily particular signals. The RSI was actually very interesting for that middle trade that we had, so I found that pretty uh, compelling, the fact that a simple baseline indicator built into your platform was still a little bit more effective than some of the more sophisticated code that we've written. The Fisher Transformer, a lot of signals, but using stacked moving averages let you clear out a little bit of the noise. And then finally, the market pulse, good for those of you looking to try and uh, get into more breakout sort of trades and just knowing the context of trend. But if you waited for the trend switch to actually happen, and then you were looking for the same ideal entry price we had with the volatility box, well, you were a little too late there. All right, hope this video was helpful. Take care, everyone. Good luck trading, and we'll see you in the next update.